my immediate left is Karen Thornbrook. She is the Professor of Comparative Literature and East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University, and she is the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard University Asia Center. Uh, I haven't asked her yet how many languages she speaks, but um, I'm sure it's not a small number. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Karen is Chris. Uh, uh, sorry, Chris. It's Webster, right? I was. I keep calling him Chris Weber in my mind, and um, Chris is uh, the dean of the School of Ar Architecture at Hong Kong University. He's a little short of degrees. He has a degree in computer science, urban planning, economics, and economic geography, or, and maybe some more. <laughs> and, and 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 the subject of you know how urbanization relates to inclusive and, and especially sustainable growth patterns and uh, achievement of the SDGs has already been talked about a little bit today, uh, but, uh, but this is a terribly important subject. And finally, Minister Hu Yafei, um, on my far left, is the former Vice Minister of Overseas Chinese Affairs in the Office of the State Council, and has a distinguished and long career um, in China's foreign service, dealing with the United States, dealing with U representing China at the United Nations, both in New York and um, Geneva. And uh, Yafei will talk about the relevant parts of the um, recently concluded 19th Party Congress and about the Belt and Road Initiative, which has significant promise to um, accelerate growth and development in a very, very wide range of uh, developing country. So the, the format is what you've come to expect. Each of our panelists will say uh, um, some words about what they're thinking about and how they see these issues. Um, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation with each other and include all of you uh, in the conversation at that point. And, and I look forward to it. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Karen. Great, okay. So put simply, the challenges of creating a sustainable, inclusive society or societies do not belong solely to the 21st century. Creating sustainable, inclusive societies has been a challenge throughout history and will likely remain so well into the future. The cycle of technology-driven reallocation of people across space is almost certain to persist. Now today I was asked to address how we might further the cause of inclusive and sustainable growth and education in such an environment. To be sure, as many have pointed out today, the hyper-globalization of the last half century has been good for developing countries, including China and India, where hundreds of millions have been lifted out of poverty. But it's also important to remember that many have been left behind in these countries. In China, more than 43 million people live on less than 95 cents a day, that's in US dollars. More than 40% of Chinese population lives on less than $5.50 a day, again in US dollars. And globally, more than 1.3 billion people continue to live in extreme poverty, which is uh, less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. Nearly half of the world's population, or more than 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. And 80% of the world population lives on less than $10 a day. Now, it's not as though the world collectively could not afford to lift people out of poverty, particularly extreme poverty. Oxfam has estimated that ending extreme global poverty would take only $60 billion annually. And I use the word only because $60 billion is less than 25% of income of the world's 100 richest billionaires. So this final figure points to the extreme inequality that pervades individual nations as well as the world of nations. To date, across much of the globe, both within their own countries and often much further afield, governments and corporations have pursued growth without working to prevent extreme inequality. Society's leaders, whether in the public or private sector, ultimately have enabled and condone massive inequality that tolerates what should be intolerable. And I'll cite here from Michael Jacobs and Marina Mazzucato's recent book, Rethinking Capitalism, Economics and Policy for Sustainable and Inclusive Growth. And they point out that between 1985 and 2013, the Gini coefficient increased in 17 OECD countries. 
It remained the same, about the same, in four OECD countries, and it decreased in only one, namely Turkey. Wealth inequality grew even faster than that of income, a consequence both of the shift of distribution of earnings away from wages and towards profits, and of the huge increase in land and property values. Jacobs and Mazzucato continue, quote, one of the striking features of Western economies over the past four decades is that even when growth has been strong, the majority of households have not seen commensurate increases in their real incomes. In the United States, real median household income was barely higher in 2014 than it had been in 1990. Though beginning earlier in the United States, this divergence of average incomes from overall economic growth has now become a feature of most advanced economies. So just to recap, those at the top of the income distribution have done extremely well. In the United States, between 1975 and 2012, the top 1% gained around 45% of the entire total of pre-tax in pre increase in incomes. In the United States, the incomes of the richest 1% rose by 142% between 1980 and 2013, and their share of national income doubled from 10 to 20%. Now, it goes without saying that inequality is also a huge concern outside of OECD countries, with the most extreme income gaps found in China, most countries in Latin America, and much of sub-Saharan Africa. So one thing that I think we need to do to further the cause of inclusive growth is changing perspectives on radical inequality. That is to say, we need to do more to convince government and corporate leaders, as well as the general public, at least in countries with a strong middle class, of the intolerability, the immorality, and the inhumaneness of radical inequality. And why is this? Well, because, of this, because it's because of the suffering, the needless suffering of those with the least. It's not that some are simply better off than others or radically better off than others. The problem is that these so-called others are often leading lives of great hardships. And it's important, if we're to further the cause of inclusive growth, that we see those at the very top of the income pile, and probably more so the governments who enable this radical inequality, as unnecessarily hindering the well-being of the vast majority, and thus of their nation and ultimately the world of nations. I think we need to understand true success not as making a handful of people extraordinarily wealthy, but rather as enabling all individuals to enjoy a life free or as free as possible of needless hardship. And I think this is one of our next great challenges and it needs to be perceived as such. Now one way to address this challenge productively is to recognize that inequality hurts the bottom line. Economic analysts have repeatedly demonstrated how rising income inequality can dampen overall economic growth. And only when economic inequality is recognized as hampering growth, and in particular as standing in the way of sustainable growth, will our leaders work more assiduously to lessen this inequality. Another way to address current challenges productively, I think, is to focus on education in a different sense. That is to say, increasing opportunities for education at all levels, as we discussed this morning. After all, it's not only about redistribution of wealth or raising the minimum wage. To be sure, in many societies, raising the minimum wage is, is essential. Societies such as the United States, and particularly societies with tremendous wealth in such societies, it makes no sense that people who work a full 35 to 40 hour week should live in poverty, regardless of what they're doing during those 35 to 40 hours. But as important as it is to increase the minimum wage so that anyone anywhere working full time is not condemned to a life of poverty or the need to work 80 hours a week simply to escape poverty, even more important is increasing opportunities for education, creating a workforce with more advanced skills, with the skills necessary to contribute to sustainable and by definition inclusive growth. And I also want to bring up the question of gender here. Inclusive growth is, by definition, growth that includes all people, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera, et cetera. And numerous studies have demonstrated that increases in female labor force participation lead to economic growth. Studies have also demonstrated that increasing educational attainment, particularly of women, accounts for uh, much of the economic growth 
in OECD countries over the past five decades. Now, I've spent much of my career as a cultural historian and scholar of literature, bringing to fore the perspectives that literature from vastly different times and places has offered into urgent matters of global concern. And when I speak of literature, I mean writing in the broadest sense. Everything from what we often consider as literature, namely poetry, plays, novels, that's, that's taken for granted. But also such things as creative nonfiction, journalism, blogs, memoirs, and other forms of writing. Film, related media, too. All forms of cultural production that provide members of the society, and most importantly, individual voices, a means through which they can make themselves heard. Just as important, literature, writing, cultural expression more generally, tends to focus on individual experiences, either the experiences of the author or the creator, or experiences that this person has imagined or created, often based on their experiences or knowledge for the purpose of the narrative. Now, why, you might ask, is access to these individual experiences so important? Well, first and foremost, what is often lost in business and policy discussion and debates, not to mention implementation, is the impact of policies and practices on real, actual, individual people and families and communities, on real, actual lives that are often exceptionally vulnerable. Literature, other forms of writing and cultural expression remind us that what we're ultimately dealing with are individuals, again, with actual people, people whose lives and well-being are often exceptionally wonderful, uh, wonderful, I wish, vulnerable, whose well-being is ultimately at the mercy of governments and corporations. And it's often in literature and other forms of writing where the high costs of inequality come to the fore. I'll just give you one recent example here. This is John Freeman's anthology, Tales of Two Americas, Stories of Inequality in a Divided Nation. As he writes in the introduction, this is Freeman, John Freeman, he says, quote, America is broken. You don't need a fistful of statistics to know this. You just need eyes and ears and stories. Walk around any American city and evidence of the shattered compact with citizens will present itself. This is not just an urban problem. In smaller cities and towns and in rural America, the gulf between the haves and the have-nots stretches just as wide. And then he goes on, this is Freeman still, and he makes the case for narrative. He says, the way systems of oppression have entrenched themselves in the United States calls out for a new framework for writing and thinking about inequality. We need to look beyond statistics and numbers and wage rates. We need to create a framework that accounts for what it feels like to live in this America a framework that can give space to the stories that reveal how many forces outside of wages lead to income inequality, which is a symptom of a network of inequalities. The work of writing has been done for decades by writers who don't have a choice but to pay attention to these forces. Piece by piece, you'll watch these writers demolish the myth of Horatio Alger. If you remember Horatio Alger, 19th century writer who in his works was basically Work hard, young man, and you'll lift yourself out of poverty. And what Freeman's saying is it no longer works that way in the United States and in many parts of the world. Uh, in America today, he says, we've come to view inequality as a problem that afflicts only the needy. What a mistake. For it's in sharing that we can alleviate a situation that pains us or that should pain us all. So as mentioned, inequality is hardly unique to America. Those of, who have been forgotten in America are far better off than the majority in many countries of the world. And so I think going forward, sustainable, inclusive growth that truly is inclusive is our best option for um, global stability uh, and global security and uh, global flourishing, despite the challenges that this offers to us and despite the fact that it requires us to think about equality and growth and success very, very differently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, we'll come back and um, talk more about these things. Um, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. The, uh, I'm going to start from the same starting point and um, probably end up somewhere quite different. Uh, which is what this what this is all about, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so the starting point was a question that Michael put to us a week or so ago. Um, is the challenge to the great, immense challenge of sustainable growth and civilization and living um, and inclusive, is it a peculiar problem of the 21st century? It seems that way. Uh, it seems that everything is piling in in terms of these uh, great big picture problematics. Uh, my um, first answer to that is the same as yours, Karen. Um, no, it's the same. Um, inequality, sustainability um, has been a feature of civilization since the beginning of civilization and probably before recorded history and civilization too. Wherever there is competition for resources, um, you get the problems of sustainability um, and inequality. The, um, the, the reasons, so I have, I have quite a bleak, pessimistic view of, of the, the problematic you've given us, uh, but some, one or two ideas at, at, at the end um, to bring it down to a slightly more optimistic um, viewpoint. The economic growth, urban, industrial-led economic growth, the, um, the story of the world, the story of the massive set change in civilization in the last 300, 300 years um, is driven by the specialization of labor. Um, specialization of labor um, drives economic growth, drives wealth creation. Um, it's, cities exist because of the specialization of labor. That's why cities, urbanization, and economic growth go hand in hand. Uh, if we were all producing what we need in subsistence to secure livelihoods for our families, we wouldn't need to aggregate and live together in cities, essentially. Specialization of labor both um, promotes and drives and, and is a consequence of, uh, of urbanization. As soon as society specializes, you get inequality. The two are um, inextricably linked. Uh, the first person to discover uh, the cowrie shell in the South Pacific as a store of value um, became very wealthy with his or her, her knowledge. Um, she knew how to collect cowrie shells. Uh, cowrie shells turned out to be the most abiding store of value in the South Pacific economy and therefore became a form of money. Um, that knowledge um, gave an advantage that was not easily shared and was very closely protected. Thus it is with every single uh, new advancement in knowledge in the course of human history. So as long as uh, labor is dividing, knowledge is becoming more specialist, um, you have inequality. So I think one of the first points at which I would sort of like debate with you is the idea that inequality is somehow bad. Inequality is not bad. It's, and is not intrinsically a constraint on growth. I mean, extreme inequality is, yeah. Extreme poverty. And, and extreme poverty, yeah, agreed. Um, so as the division of labor uh, deepens economic uh, growth and prosperity, uh, so too does uh, capital and land. Rights over capital, rights over land, as with rights over labor, uh, it deepen, deepen, fragment, fragment. Um, as economy grows and develops. And in a, in a well-oiled economy, um, land, labor, and capital specialize and fragment alongside each other, um, compounding the, in, the unequal, the effect of the unequal access to knowledge by the effects of unequal access to capital and unequal access to land. Now, uh, over the course of business cycles and technology cycles, um, the distribution from specialized knowledge um, tends to um, increase. Knowledge, wealth, potential from a technology tends to spread over a technology cycle as it becomes more common, more understood, uh, better educated people are able to use the technology. Um, so there's a natural equalizing process at every single stage of technology. Um, at one phone, at one, one, phone, one, I got back from London yesterday, excuse me if I'm 
my mind slipped. Um, at, at one point in time, the iPhone was, was dominant. Now we have many copycats. At one point in time, only a single engineer really knew how to work the iPhone operating system. Now there are hundreds and thousands of them, etc. One thing that doesn't tend to equalize um, is land value. And it so happens um, that um, most surplus value in the economy ends up one way or the other, one way or the other in land. Um, it sinks in land, and therefore you get these inter-technology cycle, intergenerational um, accumulations of wealth that drive um, part of the extreme inequalities that you're talking about. So this is a particularly, particularly uh, crucial problem for the 21st century. So let me, let me move on to the second point. If inequality is inevitable with progress and wealth creation, um, what's special about the 21st century? To get back to your, back to your question, uh, let me mention just two things that came to mind as I was dwelling on this interesting question. Uh, one is the 21st century um, is going to be the century in which the world reaches 100% urbanization. We've never been there before. If you look at a, a curve of urbanization over time, um, if you look at it even over the course of known human civilization, 6,000 years or so, um, the period in which we move from almost 0% urbanization to almost 100% urbanization appears more or less like a step function. We go along more or less 0% urbanization, and then between the late 18th century and the mid 21st century, we go from zero to almost 100%. Um, what will happen to the world, to the economy, to society, to inequality, sustainability, when we pass this point of what Ray Kurzweil called the singularity, one aspect of the singularity? So that's one way in which this century will be different. The other is, um, citing Ray Kurzweil again, um, Ray Kurzweil um, said of the 21st century, we're not going to get 100 years of progress. In the 21st century, we'll get 20,000 years of progress uh, because of the acceleration, the super, super nonlinear acceleration, of technological advancement. Moore's law, um, uh, Gordon Moore in the 1950s, 60s, um, established the law that the amount of semiconductors you can get on a chip uh, doubles each year. Uh, then it was 18 months, now it's, two, it's, it's every two years, but it's still super, super exponential. So we have super fast, unprecedented technological advancement, and all that means for knowledge specialization, and all that means for income and opportunity inequality, and you have everybody, more or less, living in cities. Uh, where they are, if you like, um, trapped in a, a city of systems um, on a limited amount, static amount of land, increasing wealth. What does that mean? It means uh, we will not escape some sort of dystopian future where we have hyper, hyper densification and continuing struggle against what you're calling abnormal or um, hyper inequality. What can be done about it? That's a very good question. Um, I, two, two thoughts in that. That's, that's over to the politicians and the, um, the high-level bureaucrats. And um, Two things that come to my mind. One is um, it's the wrong approach to try and prevent inequality. A, because it's technically and logistically and practically very, very difficult. Um, where, so, you know, where do you cut off the Gini coefficient? Where do you start to tax, um, etc.? Um, the the uh, Laffer the Laffer law shows that you can only tax so much before you your overall tax take starts to go down. So you can't even address these um, hyper inequalities with um, comprehensive tax solutions. The only thing I can think of is our radical solutions like universal income. I, I suspect we will arrive at some point 
with, with universal income uh, because we will not be able to get out of this uh, knowledge specialization leads to inequality, leads to exclusion, especially when we get into um, the, the kind of the second half of the 21st century when we've already had um, 5,000 years of technological process and we've got 15,000 left in the rest of the uh, rest of the century. So universal income, radical redistribution in that way. One, I think one specific policy that is pertinent to, to China, to Hong Kong, to the issue of land and the particular problem of land gathering all surplus and therefore becoming uh, endemically embedded in equality over multi-generations. Minimum living standards. Um, the two versions of these, one, uh, several have been attempted in the 20th, 20th century. Um, universal housing rights for all that more or less failed divisionally in Western Europe. China has just moved into that to some extent. Interesting to watch the experiment. Round of, uh, is it 30 million uh, low-cost homes built over the last 10 years. Um, another is uh, minimum space standards. I'd love to see the Hong Kong government uh, explore that as a policy idea. We put a flag in the sand, so to speak, a line in the sand, a flag on the mountain, um, and say we make a moral uh, judgment that nobody will live beyond a certain space standard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you. Well, that's uplifting. Um, we'll come back to this um, again. I, I have a whole host of questions for both of you. But um, Yafe, would you talk to us about? Uh, well, uh, thank you, thank you, Mike. My two colleagues have spoken eloquently about uh, the subject. I don't think I'd have too much to add, uh, but that's my job being a panelist, so I have uh, briefly, I will briefly offer four points, four comments. One is about China. Uh, Chinese economy is part and parcel of the global economy. And China now contributes annually more than 30% uh, to global economic growth, more than 30%. So China, in reality, is one of the major engines driving the global economy. Uh, it's very important for China to keep doing what has been doing as an engine. But the thing is, we are also facing great challenges. The challenge being, as with other countries, the old driving forces that our economy, economic growth relies on are puttering, are dying out. We, of course, are seeing on a daily basis the emergence of lots of new technologies artificial intelligence, which I've been discussing, robotics, biotechnology, renewable energies, but we are yet to see one or two major tech technological breakthroughs that will bring us new engine, most powerful engines to drive our economy, I mean, global economy on another takeoff a new period of rapid growth. We're not there yet, so we are kind of in between. That is something we need to take notice of. China is in the same situation. We are, uh, you know, you hear President Xi speaking to the party's Congress, talking about uh, China's economic growth, what we are, our target is, but again, the challenge is we need to find new drivers for economic growth. Uh, China's recipe, of course, is we need to engage more deeply in reform, reforming our economic structure to do more supply side. It's not a traditional supply side. It's a, it's a, I would say, 
an updated version of a supply side structural reforms, meaning you need to provide services, commodities that people need, especially our young people. You know, the traditional commodities may be abundant, in abundance, too many of them. But people don't like it. People do not welcome them. People need new, creative, more exciting services and goods. There is a mismatch. So, of course, uh, green economy, innovative, innovation-driven economy, uh, a more balanced regional economic development, all of these things are all, you know, need to be, uh, need to be found. This is one thing about China. China faces challenges too. Secondly, I think we face a big challenge globally, that is the rising tides of anti-globalization, populism, nationalism, political radicalization, deepening social division, et cetera, et cetera, which proved to be hindering economic growth because national leaders are diverted. They do not have much time for focusing on economic policy because they, are, they have to deal with those crises one after another, political crisis, social crisis, immigration, terrorist attack, et cetera, et cetera. What can we do about anti-globalization, which is rooted or which is a result of what my colleague has talked about, inequality or extreme inequality. Uh, I uh, have been saying this for some time because uh, like Mr. Piketty said in his book, uh, The Capital of 21st Century, published in 2015, for the last several decades, the returns on capital always outstrips the nominal GDP growth. So the conclusion is that whoever who holds capital gains much more from globalization. The wealth created by globalization is not equally distributed, will never be each equally distributed. It tend to accumulate a move toward those people those few people who hold capital, together, of course, with knowledge, with, with, uh, with technology, et cetera. So the balance is always there, imbalance. The imbalance between market efficiency and social justice. I, I read an article, I forgot, an American professor who wrote a piece about that. Half jokingly, he said, we really have no solution for that. And he said, only two solutions possibly. One is war. You know, you start a war, you destroy everything, every, everybody is equal, you know, destitute. Secondly is a violent revolution. Violence, violent revolution, you take away all the wealth from the rich people, and then you create a, 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 a kind of egalitarian society. Of course, these are not options really we like or we can, we can have. Other than that, he said, he doesn't know what to do. Maybe that, that's the challenge for our young people to answer. So that's the biggest challenge globally for us to have sustainable and inclusive growth. Thirdly, I am a, a, I used to be a career diplomat and more a strategist uh, than, rather than on specific economic policies. My involvement in economics or finance started, you know, in in in, G, in terms of G20. i I was the first China shepherd to G20 since 2008. Uh, that got got myself involved in financial issues. Uh, another challenge is geopolitical, because it seemed to me geopolitical differences, to say the least, or geopolitical entanglements, to put it mildly, is getting, is getting much worse now. Mm -hmm. You look at US-Russia relationship, 
they seem to go into another cold war, even a hot war. Even a hot war. Uh, Russia used to have a, strate a strategic buffer area of more than 1,600 kilometers. But now, everything's gone. The NATO expansion has gone eastward to Ukraine. So there is no strategic space anymore for Russia. So from Russia's standpoint, it's natural. It will react very dramatically. So you have Russia-US relationship in a, in a dive. And of course, you have this, this whatever you call it, Thucydides trap yeah. between the rising power, which is China, and incumbent power, which is the United States. A lot of predictions about inevitable military confrontation beneath the two. Can we, can we avoid it? If people are actively, proactively thinking about <clears throat> how to avoid that trap or to be prepared for that eventuality, a lot of resources will be diverted for that purpose. I'm, I'm sorry to say I've been listening to President Donald Trump speaking on his Asian trip on every stop. One thing is always there, that is he wants the country he visited or he, is, he was visiting to buy more American arms. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. Very strange for a president of the United States to you know, always talking about you need to buy more. Buy more what? Arms. So if we cannot really overcome geopolitical differences, rise above ideological divide, economic growth will be a dream. Will be a dream. Globalization will be a delusion rather than a reality. This is a third thing. Lastly, what will China do or what is China doing to address this issue? China is very much aware of these challenges. So in the last few years, as China entered a new era of uh, on, our, on our way to become a, one of the major powers, we have divided Chinese history, recent history, into three stages. Uh, became a nation state, independent nation state in the year 1949 with the new republic. Uh, in late 70s, uh, when Mr. Deng Xiaoping led us uh, on the path of opening up a reform, that's for economic growth. Now we are in a stage or on our way to become one of the major powers. So what China will do, or what roadmap China will have for it to achieve that status is extremely important. China is determined, as it is clearly said in the party's Congress, one peaceful development. We will not deviate from the chosen path of peaceful growth, peaceful development. Secondly, China is ready to provide a global commons, not to replace the United States, but as an additional provider of global commons. The Belt the Road Initiative is one AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, is another. Silk Road Fund, you know, a promotion from ASEP, free trade uh, agreement of the region, and also additionally now lately we try to promote APEC-wide free trade zone, free trade agreement. The central China now is very much aware of its responsibility as a would-be major power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, very, very good. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, there's a lot to think about here. Let, let me ask um, a couple of follow-up questions, Karen. In your studies of literature broadly defined, do you find clues as to what I'm, what I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you find clues as to why we collectively appear to be relatively insensitive to 
radical inequality? I mean, what you say is so pervasive, and yet, and there's lots of literature. I even read some of it, you know, in the Industrial Revolution, the Dickens books, and so on. They're horrifying, and um, and cement the conclusion that both of you have stated that while there are some new things in the world every century, I mean, this, you know, struggling with these very difficult, uh, I call them transitions, it's difficult, but I wonder, you know, this pattern of having radically poor people around and, and not responding, which is my characterization of the source of much of the anger that's dividing our society. Can you find reasons for this? I mean, why we seem so, or why we are so insensitive. Yeah, insensitive yeah. yeah, I think one thing that comes across in a lot of writings, again, regardless of genre, is that we just, people are out for themselves. I mean, and that sounds so simple, but it, it, it bears repeating. People are out for themselves, and secondarily, their families. And there's this strange thing that happens, that the wealthier one becomes, or the more successful one becomes, the more one is convinced that one earned it solely by one's own power. Um, you know, in the US, we have this myth of, you know, the West and the independence and, you know, the successful entrepreneur or whatever, without taking into consideration that no individual is able to be successful on their own without support of infrastructure, without support of, you know, if you're if you're a you know own a, own, a, own a corporation without all the workers who are working for you, but there's the, there is this myth of you know particularly well maybe not particularly but certainly in the United States that I did it myself and the richer one becomes the more one is convinced of this and the less inclined in many ways one is to turn around back and say okay I've been fortunate in my life to have the education the health the opportunities the support the ambition if nothing else, and now I need to help lift others out of poverty. I, I came here yesterday from Malaysia where uh, I was spending a couple days with one of the donors of the Asia Center, uh, Jeffrey Chia, who's one of the richest uh, men in Malaysia. And uh, he was talking to me about his own philosophy, which is you know very different from that of his fellow um, multimillionaires slash billionaires. And, he said, you know, for him, the most important thing is to, um, you know, follow the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and to make those goals a reality. And, you know, you're all probably familiar with these, but in case not, you know, no poverty, zero hunger, good health, well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water, et cetera, et cetera. And in the university he founded, he has signs, of, you know, of these things all over the place. But his big complaint to me was that he said his other, you know, fellow um, millionaires, billionaires, um, didn't see it that way. They didn't see it as their responsibility to give back to the society, and that he was trying to inspire them to do so by, you know, donating so much of his own time and money to these causes. And that's not, he's not the first person I've heard that from. I think, you know, among the people who've been extraordinarily successful, there's a small percent that realize, you know, it's their responsibility now to help others so that, to try to eradicate this extreme poverty. But there are countless more, and you know, President Trump, unfortunately, is a great example of this, of those who are bound and determined that, um, you know, they, they should keep everything and, in fact, make inequality worse. And, you know, look at the repeal or threatened repeal of the estate tax in the United States, you know, something that really only affects the top, top percent. Um, less yeah, less than 1%. Right. And so I think what's, what's very frustrating to me and um, many of us in the United States is that it's just getting worse. And it doesn't have to get worse. There's always going to be inequality. You know, I completely agree with that. And that's not really so much the issue. The issue is the extremes and that so many continue to live in extreme poverty in the United States, but you know, also around the world, and that they do so when there's extreme wealth, like super extreme wealth at the other end. And I think that's where the, the problem comes in. Anyway, I've talked for far too long. No, no that's yeah. very interesting. Um, Mike, can I 
yeah, pick absolutely. up on the, the, no, this is perfect. the issue of literature. It's fascinating. I'd not really thought about that until I um, heard you speaking there. The, um, I, I wonder whether um, literature helps both dampen and smooth and exacerbate all the trends that are going on that we're discussing. So um, the culture, well, a challenge to the idea that at the end of the 19th century, um, there was um, horrendous inequality and poverty that nobody cared about. I don't think that, I don't think history tells us that that was the case. Um, at the end of, by the end of the 19th century, the, um, both in Europe, particularly UK, and to an extent in America, there was, there was a very, very strong um, philanthropic response. So the, uh, many of the big, uh, or for example, many of the big um, mutual funds uh, started off in the mid to late 19th century as first of all a voluntary uh, and then a commercial corporate response to extreme poverty, providing people with death benefits, uh, yeah. rudimentary pension schemes, destitute schemes. Um, all of the, nearly all of the dimensions of the modern welfare state system in the UK emerged through legislation um, at the end of the 19th century. Most of that legislation was um, promoted by philanthropists. Um, and so th there's a, th there are cycles, there are, there are responses. And one hypothesis would be that literature is very, very important. Uh, Dickens was probably very, very important in producing the Charles Booths, uh, the Shaftesbury's, and the other people. That's very yeah, interesting. Great. Um, I wanted to, just one more question along these lines. It didn't come up this morning, but in my conversations with people and reading, it seems that, um, if I can put it this way, uh, not all inequality is created equal. That is, people care apparently deeply about how it was acquired, pretty much universally everywhere. So I hear relatively few complaints about Jack Ma or Bill Gates, you know, or some of the more highly uh, compensated entertainers. But I do, and my colleague Joe Stiglitz is uh, quite vocal about this, saying that what really irks people is that the system is rigged, uh, and that, that accumulations of very large pools of income and wealth uh, are occurring that you can't associate with just some flat out extraordinary merit or something. Is this uh, a component of at least the modern challenge, or is it misleading somehow? Is that directed at me? Yeah, any of you can take a shot at that. Yeah. The, uh, I, I have a particular view on that. So the, uh, yes, I, I absolutely agree. Not all inequality is equal. Um, I think, personally, I think a lot of the um, bad type of inequality and the extremes um, are created by ill-advised policy, government policy, uh, which aligns itself to, to the interests of the, the moneyed and wealthy. Um, no better example in recent times, in the last 10 years, uh, than virtually zero or even negative interest rates, um, which have, fab and a quantitative easing which has fabulously inflated all forms of asset values, um, from from shares to gold to to um, property, um, particularly shares. America is just about to break, isn't it? I imagine. Um, and the people, uh, the very very rich, very very wealthy, who rely on their income growth. So that takes us to the obscene levels of inequality you're talking about. Most of that, one suspects, in the last 10 years has come from asset inflation rather than earning anything in the real economy. And the flip side is that most hard workers who've saved very hard have got zero interest on their savings and become relatively poor. That's a government policy. That's the, the federal um, central banks. That's, yeah. Yeah, 
President Xi, I'm, I know you want to respond to this, but President Xi is enormously popular now, I believe, based on everything I've heard. Um, I assume this is in part because of a vigorous anti-corruption campaign and restoring the commitment of not only the Chinese Communist Party, but a rather broader set of institutions, including private sector ones, to uh, focusing at least to some extent on, on shared goals and values, on the what I sometimes call the public interest. Um, is, is this uh, important? Is this right? Is it, or is something else going on? <laughs> well, you're right. President Xi is extremely popular in China because he uh, has been leading China on to a path for China to to become great again. Um, if I may quote, <laughs> may quote Donald Trump. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, seriously, it's a China dream to rejuvenate China, make China a powerful nation once again on world stage, or one of them. Uh, but coming back to inequality, you're right. Inequality does exist everywhere, including China, including Hong Kong. So the issue is not whether it exists or why it exists. I think that we should focus our efforts on how to address that issue, or at least alleviate the extreme inequality that is tearing society apart or tearing the fabric of, so, of our society apart. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I think the, the guideline or the guiding principle in the past, especially the neoliberalism in economic terms, including the Washington Consensus, by over-relying over -relying on market, quote unquote, over on market, believing market is everything, it can correct itself, you know, trickling down theories, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is a mistake. Mm -hmm. That has been proven, had been proven not effectively, cannot effectively address that particular issue. We do need the visible hand of government to intervene, to intervene at the appropriate times, not to over stifle, not to stifle the market forces, but to offer a recorrection, a correction whenever necessary to overcome the extreme inequality. For instance, we need to eliminate absolute poverty like China has been doing, and our target by 2020 is to eliminate totally in China absolute poverty. You, you still have inequality, you know, between and among regions. Absolute poverty is inhuman. We need to eliminate it wherever it is. So uh, we need to maintain a balance, really a balance of market and government. The invisible hand and visible hand, both are needed. The key, of course, is to have the right balance, right mix. That, that's the difficulty. And that baffles lots of economists. Well, I think that's right. And let me just add to that. I mean, I think, as I described this morning, I mean, I think we sort of forgot about that in the kind of um, heyday of the early post-war period where we didn't have to worry about it too much. And, uh, and, and I, I would only add to what you just said that, you know, you have to keep at it because the right balance changes with time and circumstances and internal and external shocks and technology and so on. Let me try one other thing and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. There is a, a, a what I guess a minority of people who are uh, ostensibly writing history who in one form or other say something close to what Chris said a moment ago, and that is that there are deeply embedded trends in capitalism that produce um, vast accumulations of wealth in the hands of a small number of people. Um, 
Maybe they're countered by the kind of balancing act that Yafe introduced. But this group of people says the way that gets reset is, and you used the term, uh, uh, no, Yafe used it, is, is by some convulsion. Wars do it. Revolutions do it. Uh, and when I was working on the Growth Commission with much more knowledgeable colleagues than I, it was pretty obvious that the very high measured income inequality in the world, which was in South America, Latin America, and, uh, and in the places where it's even been measured in sub-Saharan Africa, there'd been no major land and or asset redistribution. Now in your home country, I believe, the way that was accomplished was to tax land so heavily that eventually <laughs> people had to turn them into bed and breakfast. But <laughs> is it, it, are these convulsions kind of periodically necessary, or is this excessively dramatic way of thinking about history and these cycles? Personally, I think they. I think they, they are inevitable if, if the safety valve is not released. Um, so you talked about revolutions and war. The um, war is easier than revolution because it's easier to uh, form a coalition, get an interest, and um, revolutions within a country are more pro problematic and gestate for longer, I think. so. But if, if something is not done about severe inequality, I think particularly absolute poverty. I'm, I'd really like to speak to an economic historian or political scientist who knows whether there's ever been either a revolution or a war on the basis of relative poverty. I, I somehow doubt it. Um, it. Absolute poverty, yes. And... I agree totally with you. Absolute poverty is a moral travesty, and that should be the priority of all governments talking about. It. I think most, many, many governments in the OECD countries are more fixated on social exclusion and relative poverty. I don't think that's, that produces convulsions of the, talk, the type that you're talking about. I've just been handed a note that says I'm incompetent. Um, no, not quite. <laughs> There's 10 minutes remaining, so we can maybe make it 12. So uh, we're going to stop here, and I'm going to ask you to take over. I'll hand up the mic. I'm an all-purpose character here. I have two uh, questions. One is the uh, question about central banks uh, doing QE and actually raising asset value for the rich ones, where the poor ones don't have anything to have it raised. Uh, at the time when Hank Paulson and, uh, and Nanke was uh, dealing with a the crisis, uh, they were injecting and, you know, injecting basically everything they have and forcing the banks to take on capital, printing money, because they have no idea what's going to happen next. Now, among economists, I mean, looking back, was there an alternative at that time? Okay. Yeah. So, no, no. There, you, you, it's important to distinguish between the initial response, which was to a crisis that could have brought the whole house down, and then the subsequent response, which was to force people out into riskier assets, drive the asset prices up, hold, hold the, so the controversy surrounds that second step. Think of it as quantitative easing. There's almost no controversy that surrounds the first response. I mean, okay. there's near unanimity that we would have had. So the dragging out the like continuation yeah. of the QE. Yeah. The second question I have is to do with the uh, discussion about sustainability. Um, I, I haven't heard much about the question of food and water security. Uh, climate change is an obvious one because the world inevitably will have, as you said, maybe 100 or 75 percent of people living in a city, so sustainable city. Uh, these are issues that we have to face uh, despite Trump. So is there any thoughts on this question about sustainable 
uh, sustainability at all if we don't address those issues. Huh? Well, it's it's, uh, it's a, such an important but such a big question. It's hard to know where to place an answer. But um, one way of answering is that probably there needs to be a lot more investment, infrastructure investment, to maintain water security. Um, the countries with um, effective de facto or legal ownership over land, like your great country, our great country, um, have an advantage because uh, you can stop cities growing. Um, there is a land, there is separate land control, land take regulation in China, um, other than city growth management, which is effectively ring fence cities for the sake of food security. Most of the world's government systems don't have that luxury, and therefore there is a very, very difficult uh, tension to address. Uh, my, my take on that is that uh, the future will involve much, much greater regulation. Um, as more and more people live in cities, uh, there are far more th the density of externalities, social costs imposed on other people um, that are non-priced, uh, become, becomes very, very um, problematic, and that will trigger new rounds of government regulation to stop building, uh, to uh, force investment in, um, for example, forcing house builders um, to invest in water and other utility infrastructure, um, which is uh, not common in Europe um, for, the, for the developer to assume the cost of some of these infrastructures that help mitigate against sustainability problems. I just want to add to that that a lot of it also involves changing public consciousness. Uh, particularly the idea that investing in sustainability, that these kind of regulations are bad for business. And I think that's one of the problems that's really uh, confronting the United States now is that our leaders and enough of their followers are convinced that uh, anything that's good for the environment or good for sustainability is necessarily bad for business. And that's been shown time and time again that that's not actually true, that solar technologies, emerging technologies, uh, actually are very good for business. But there's still, as we talked about this morning in a different context, there's a communications problem. Uh, we haven't gotten the message out uh, that sustainability can be good for business and it's good for human societies thinking forward, but often we only think short term and what's in our short term best interest. And for the United States, that's you know drilling in Alaska, it's opening pipelines, it's turning uh, monuments and other uh, protected spaces uh, over to private developers because that gives you the quick fix without thinking again long term and what's best for us. So it's a communications problem. I, I agree. I I only want to add one thing is that food security, water security are, are the real challenges. But these challenges are global in nature. Now the response, as she has suggested, is more short term than long term, more national than global. So we need to really uh, put our heads together to use platforms av available to us the UN, United Nations, regional organizations, G20, etc., to work together to find solutions which can offer global solutions because global challenges need global solutions. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm the Canadian Consul General here in Hong Kong, Jeff Nankabel, and I hope someday to be a distinguished former diplomat like Hu Yafei. Um, uh, I've worked a lot on development issues in, in China and, and Asia over the years in different jobs. And I, I think, you know, as seen from space, really the, the, the biggest phenomenon, and, and Professor Webster uh, it started with this, is urbanization. If we talk about Asia, it's urbanization. That's the, that's the biggest thing. And, and uh, it would be interesting to hear a, a bit more 
about the relationship projecting ahead as urbanization continues across Asia. I think we know generally people who move to cities become more productive. Uh, the you know, income levels go up, access to education, social services, kind of social, social connections uh, of a certain type uh, go up. Uh, of other types, they can, they can go down. But um, uh, the, the very complex interrelationship between urbanization and inequality, and I know, you know in, in the story in China about inequality for many years has been that the greatest inequality is not between regions but, or between the coast and the, and the interior, but it's between the urban and the rural residents in the same areas wherever they are around the country. And I think we see that in many parts of, of Asia. And, and so if we project out a few decades of, of urbanization, how do we see inequality uh, being affected by those, those trends? Uh, okay, I'm the other person. <laughs> yes. Um, Urbanisation. Well, one way of starting to answer that is that uh, rural migrants in China move to cities for pecuniary reasons and welfare reasons. Um, research shows that people sometimes actually do move and experience a, an effective net reduction in income or wealth well-being, um, but that's usually for the sake of investing in their children and social reproduction, so to speak. Um, so you have to start off with the assumption, I think it's reasonable to, um, that urbanization generally distributes welfare rather than concentrates, it does concentrate it, but it also redistributes it to the rural urban migrants. So that's good in terms of um, inequality. So over the last 10, 15, uh, 15, 20 years, 200 million rural poor have moved to the cities of, um, in China. For the future, um, inequality within the urban area will get worse, one presumes, um, as the rich get richer. Um, it depends what statistical base you look at, actually. Um, if you uh, move, move sideways, think sideways. Uh, Malaysia, you've just been to Malaysia. Um, I was working in Malaysia and Thailand 30 years ago. Uh, if you look at the statistics, um, the density of cities, the growth of the middle class, professional class, uh, now, and you look at one shot in time 30 years ago. I used to work in a development bank in Bangkok 30 years ago, my first job. Um, if you look at the cross-sectional inequality at that time, uh, we would have been sort of horrifying about it. Um, 30, 35 years later, um, many of the villages, many of the very impoverished villages of that time um, have benefited from remittances, uh, from return migrant children. Uh, the, the secondary and the tertiary cities have all become middle income in, in the central region, the northern region. Chiang Mai was just a, a little backwater. Uh, now it's the second city with a very good urban GDP. Over time, these things have a habit of trickling down to some extent. I, I understand the critique of trickling down, but trickle down does happen. Um, so what's going to happen in, it depends on the country, it depends on the politics, depends on the governance, um, and it's not always that free market is bad and strong government is good. Quite often, well, it's a balance, as you say, that's, that's needed. And it's not just a, any balance. It's a wise balance that keeps the incentives flowing in the right way while keeping a safety net. Now, if I may add, uh, there has been a debate in China which goes on for some time about urbanization. What kind of uh, urbanization do we need? Do we really need to have more mega cities with 20 million, 30 million people, uh, in which there will be, as you were mentioning, there will be a, 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 uh, a huge difference 
in incomes between rural uh, urban dwellers or even within urban dwellers, there will be a huge income uh, disparity, which is not desirable. So when you look at uh, some of the European countries, you see they have cluster of small urban areas, small cities. There's not really a line, you cannot see a real line between urban and rural areas. I, I was ambassador to, to Geneva for some, for some years. I've been touring Switzerland. And once we have a delegation from China to study how China can overcome the difference between urban and rural, rural uh, disparity. And I said, you couldn't find it in Switzerland because there was no such thing. In Switzerland, you can call it rural or urban. They are the same thing. You know, there's no line. That's the ideal urbanization. Of course, that will take maybe dozens of years to, to, to do that. But we should try not to go in the direction of building mega, mega cities. I'm not a true believer of that. We should do more to create cluster of urban centers, small in size, but e more equal in income uh, in incomes.